I like Cleveland, you know, as it relates to a competitive team. So, yep. uh, but the Bucks are a team that within the last few hours uh, I've heard uh, is a mutual benefit uh, to both uh, Melo and Milwaukee. And um, we'll see if they bite. I just don't think he has it anymore. <laughs> Should any team want Carmelo Anthony? Blasphemous. Yes, sir, Carmelo. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Control the Narrative, a podcast where we control the narrative that the media creates. If you're new around here, subscribe to catch our weekly podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And if you're a returner, a subscriber, or better yet, a Control the Narrative member, we appreciate you all, but the members a little bit more. We just dropped one of the members' favorite members-only merch drops yet. Uh, go check it out on Twitter, at CTRL Narrative. We retweeted it. Um, members get a free Control the Narrative members-only merch drop every three months. So go check that out. Um, we're going to get into this thing. If you have watched a, even five minutes of any of our podcasts, in the 117 episodes so far, you know that we're big fans of Carmelo Anthony. And you also know that, well, you don't know this, but we're recording this on Monday, October 17th. And by the time you see this, listen to it, watch it, the season has already started. And most likely, more likely than not, and I would love to be wrong, but Carmelo Anthony is not an M- on an NBA roster, um, which sucks. So when I was thinking about it, instead of all the speculating and and doing all this stuff that we've been doing, honestly, the last like four months, I was like, let's bring in someone who has a scoop, who probably has more info than us, and just see if he knows what's going on. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome back to Control the Narrative, Brandon Robinson. Robinson, Scoop B. Welcome back to the show, brother. Brother, what's going on? <laughs> Not much, man. Just waiting on this Woj tweet, this Scoop B tweet, Carmelo signs with this team, and we just haven't gotten it. But other than that, life's well, good. That's the company, first and foremost. <laughs> Second of all, um, I would like to see Carmelo on a team as well. Um, but there's been a lot of chatter back and forth from folks that I've spoken to just about size, fit, um, and just all of that good stuff. And yeah. I'm hopeful that he does sign with a team because we went through this a uh, couple years ago with yeah. uh, Melo, and then ultimately he signed with the Portland Trailblazers. Yep. And again, it just feels like deja vu with this stuff where he just came off a great season with the Lakers. One of the only players who like did their job on that team with, with so many players, obviously disappointed. So let, let's get to the first question. I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on. He's been linked to multiple teams over the summer, you know, even dating back to uh, pre free agency by you, other reporters out there. Um, but he isn't on a, on a roster as the season starts. Do you think that this is his decision, or do you think that no formal offers have been made to him? Both. Interesting. So, first and foremost, uh, had a decent season as a member of the Lakers last year. Um, the Lakers dealt with a lot of injuries even to start the season. In fact, this beginning of the season, as far as personnel who's available and who's not, reminds me of um, last year. Um and Melo stepped into a situation. He started a couple of games uh, for the Lakers and um, really helped that team uh, at the beginning of the season. And, you know, ultimately this summer, uh, Juan Toscano Anderson won a championship with the Warriors, raised his value, and uh, the Lakers knocked on his door and he answered. And so that we, we kind of knew from that point of view from the jump, the Lakers would likely not be um, the the, per- the team that – uh, would be uh, going after him. And so we sat around and waited. And then, you know, we looked at the situation with the Brooklyn Nets. Um, and and I know that just if you paid attention to my my reporting over the summer, um, you know, the, the, the winds and, 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 and turns and twists and all the things that come with the story that is always the, the Brooklyn Nets, uh, the, the Kyrie and, and Kevin Durant saga, Ben Simmons was kind of quiet, but, you know, figuring out what Kai and KD were going to do was, was definitely – I was chasing that on vacation. I was in Mexico. Um, so in between spending time at the pool, I was I was checking my phone. Um, in between those but, pina coladas? Um, more so uh, berry smoothies with a little something extra in it. It was, it was phenomenal. It was an area where they had 
a sushi bar. So I would like have sushi, be poolside, and then go upstairs check because I would leave my phone in, in my room, but they would come back and have all these messages. And it's kind of cool thing. They have all inclusive and then you can phone in and do radio interviews as Respect. well. It was definitely dope. But um, I will say that um, what happened between then and probably about August was this. Um, I know that ultimately Kai and Kevin were communicating all summer um, and, and, you know, Kai opted in and then Kevin requested to trade. And I know that they both wanted Carmelo uh, to be uh, in a black and white uniform uh, on Atlantic Avenue. Um, but, but in speaking the Nets personnel, um, the thing that I go, walk away with is what they've shared with me was they want somebody that is of a leadership position. Um, and I know that, um, they're very high on Utah. Um, Wantanabe, I think, is the way his last name is pronounced. Yep. And, you know, ultimately he's filling the role uh, that Melo would fill. Um, and so what ended up happening in between then and now, spoke with Dwight Howard. You know, he shared that he would have mutual interest. I know the Nets were looking for a big man. You fast or rewind to uh, the Nello Gallinari's injury. Um, and folks that I spoke to on the, the Boston Celtics side, um, said that he was a guy that they were considering. And then other colleagues were saying that, that were reporting rather that they had interest about the um, defensive portion of it. Um, and then at the point when I spoke with folks within the Celtics organization, this was pre eme uh, and all that came with that. Um, and it, it was my understanding that there was mutual interest there. Um, they ended up signing Blake Griffin. Um, and then it got quiet again. Uh, I spoke to someone on the mellow side and was told Phoenix, Golden State, um, the Nets, and the Knicks. Now, the Knicks portion of it was contingent upon Donovan Mitchell. If Donovan Mitchell were to become a Nick, uh, from everyone that I spoke to, there was, there was a conversation uh, to ship Julius Randle out. Um, and had that been a thing on the side of uh, Mitchell, Carmelo would have been in. Uh, I, I got that on the account of about two or three different people. Um, I went on two vacations. I'm measuring things from the summer based on like on my couch versus on a beach. But I remember <laughs> sitting on my couch playing Madden and, and, and I was texting with somebody and, and in between playing, they said to me that the Julius Randle thing is something the Knicks were shopping uh, and that Donovan Mitchell ultimately, um, if he becomes a Nick, um, that'll be, and then I don't know if you saw, but I was on another vacation and I remember somebody asking me if not the Knicks, then who? And I said, don't sleep on the calves. I put my phone down. I'm in, I'm in Bahamas at that point. I come back hours later. I look at my mentions like, holy shit. School, <laughs> he's a calf. I said, yo, I'm, I'm done with y'all. Like it was hilarious, but those were that day, right? The same like, day? What'd you say? The same day, right? Um, it was like maybe like a day and a half, maybe 36 hours apart. Got it. I guess day and a half and 36 hours is the same thing. No more than two days. I remember like going to the airport or being either because I was between Florida and Bahamas. And I remember somewhere between traveling, somebody said, if not the Knicks, then who? And I said, don't sleep on the Cavs because I had been hearing it. it. It was conversation like. I remember being at a conference and talking to some of my colleagues, and I know there were guys that were speaking to certain front office folks in Utah, certain front office folks in Cleveland, and then I was having a conversation on the Knicks side, and it was I was at the National Association of Black Journalists, and I was having a conversation with some other NBA writers, and they're like, yo, everybody thinks it's the Knicks. And then I met with somebody I know, and they were like, Cleveland is really like quietly that, that team. So... I had been hearing it for like a, about two, three weeks. So when somebody asked me, I was like, yeah, I knew what the Knicks, the Knicks conversation was an ongoing conversation. I had tweeted about that during the playoffs. The Knicks was Donovan's preference. Yep. They didn't come with the best deal. They, the Jazz wanted Julius Randle. And if Julius Randle was moved to Utah and Donovan Mitchell came to New York, Carmelo Anthony was going to be there too. So Randle was going to be in that Mitchell trade? No, that was from what I, the people that I spoke to, that was a separate trade. They were inquiring in a separate move. So it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been Randall. It was the contingent upon the, the Utah deal. And if, if they got um, Donovan, then the Knicks were looking to move Randall. And if they move Randall, they were going to fill in Randall's role with Mello. Interesting. Cause 
what we heard was like the Obi thing and like me not no insider like you, but the Obi thing where Obi was going to be included. And then that opened up a spot at the backup four in New York. So I know that the Utah jazz from folks that I spoke with uh, that were, that were talking to folks on the Utah side. I know that from that conversation with my colleagues that the jazz were were very heavily interested in Obi. Um, and I heard that from about two different people. Yeah. Um, and the Knicks were not willing to move Obi. They were willing to potentially uh, ship Randall. But from what I understand, Randall was a separate deal. I know that the Pacers were a conversation um, that the Knicks were having. But ultimately, um, if they were to move Randall to the Pacers, they were in turn looking to bring Melo back. And, and that, you know, I just remember being somewhere warm and checking my phone and, and like, yo, Scoop, what's going on? And then... I remember while I was on vacation, I had gotten a call. This was like, this was the day after the MTV Awards. This was when Carmelo gave Bad Bunny the um, the yeah. award at Yankee Stadium. Yep. And I got a text message from somebody and they were like, yo, um, Gallo's injury is worse. Like they're, they're kind of moving gingerly as it relates to whether it was ACL. And I think the next day their reporter was an ACL, but I was on one end on the Boston side, I was hearing that. And then I was also hearing um, maybe like, yeah, I, I remember like getting a text. And they were like, yo, Mello um, is, is, a, is somebody that they're looking at. And I heard this on the Boston side. This wasn't even on the Mello side of it. It made sense. And then I know that some people were shooting it down. Oh, defense, defensively, he's not this, he's not that. Then, Ime was 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 let go, and then you know if you look at the replacement, that guy was there during when the head coach, the the president was uh, was a coach. So he's from from what I gather, he's going to move kind of like him, and less like yeah. just from a basketball perspective, Ime. So when they brought in Blake, I wasn't really surprised because I just know that Griffin defensively impressed them when he was a member of the Nets. Um, in the playoffs, and they all eventually lost. And how much clock he just didn't get in, in Steve Nash's rotation. So, yep. um, and then you saw Robert Williams the third. He's out for extended amount of time. So it was questions of just you know. I know that not only was Melo somebody that the, the Celtics were looking at, they were looking at Lamarcus Aldridge. They were lost also looking at Dwight Howard. Um, and then you know the net situation was what it was. They started to take form, and um, and then I started asking around in Brooklyn, and they were saying to me that. He's been talked about a lot, or excuse me, he has not been talked about a lot, but that Dwight Howard's name is, is brought up a lot more than Mello. But then, you know, the conversation is, well, is he a leader? And so that's kind of the the, the portion of it. Now, in, in recent days, uh, I had put out a tweet that he's going to be a little bit more busier. Um, the reason why I said that was because um, I reached out to um, some folks to try to get him uh, – over in my program. And he said, yeah, his schedule is actually starting to get a little busier. Um, and so I'm leaving out certain things for re out of respect, but um, the Nets portion of it is still a, a thing of an interest because, um, you know, there's guys that are, that are out. Joe Harris will not be ready for the start of the season. Seth Curry will not be start of the season, but I'll add another team uh, that you may want to actually pay attention to. Um, based off of conversation, and that's the Milwaukee Bucks, who were without Chris Middleton. Um, that's another team that that I think is is almost like the uh, Portland Trailblazers moving. That's a great fit. Oh, um, he'd fit like a glove in Milwaukee. Um, he compliments Giannis. He and Drew Holiday will get along, and, and it'll give him a chance to really compete. It's not a foregone conclusion that Brooklyn, uh, Philadelphia uh, are, are going to win it all. Um just like I like Cleveland, you know, as it relates to a competitive team. So yep. uh, but the Bucks are a team that within the last few hours uh, I've heard uh, is a mutual benefit uh, to both uh, Mello and Milwaukee. And um, we'll see if they bite. That's a great fit. You know, people have brought up Milwaukee a lot. And I always thought like strong defensive team, they could use another guy who can create their own shot. So that makes a lot of sense. My my quick follow up to you, um, with this whole Knicks thing is, yo, real quick, sorry to interrupt if you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, but just wanted to let you know that we have merch at Control the Narrative and it's a uh, pretty fire in my opinion. This is the Pixel Mellow T-shirt that I'm rocking. Anything from Cuse Mellow to New York Mellow hoodie Mellow on this shirt, 
We got scapegoat merch. We got black ball merch. We got just regular control merch. Um, shop ctrldenarrative.com. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, beanies, stickers. Shop ctrldenarrative.com. I think I got my point across. Go check it out. I bet you you'll find something you like. Appreciate the support as well. Obviously, you know, the merch sales help us fund these podcast episodes that we get to record every single week. So appreciate you um, and back to the show. Do you feel, because you said both in terms of he had formal offers and also like it's kind of his decision. Do you think he was banking on the New York thing? And then once that didn't happen, it, it kind of just went into panic mode. I think the situation with the Knicks is similar to what it was with the Lakers with LeBron in year one pre-Anthony Davis. Uh, if if Melo had signed in 2019, 2020, 2021 might have been his year to win a championship. And the Lakers had like an unspoken, yo, come through situation. And because of the way it looked at the end of that season, he wanted to be in a situation where he won a championship. Very next year, they won a championship in the bubble. Um, I will say that the Knicks is a similar situation, similar but different. There's no LeBron James on that team. Um, but at the same time, they're a young team. And I think they're a young team with, with upside and promise. They're like, to me, they remind me of that Suns team when Jamal Crawford was there right before Chris Paul got there. And they went to the bubble and they were the opening act in the bubble. Um, the Knicks, to me, uh, I, I, you know, the Nets is where I got my start, but New York City basketball, grassroots, and being around Sprite Junior Knicks and Riverside Church, you know, I have a, have a great deal of respect for New York City hoops. Um, they've not been good, but at the same time, um, I think the personnel that they have on the floor, uh, they're growing. And I think they're really looking to fix the mistakes that they made when they traded the house to get Carmelo Anthony. So, you know, when I looked at that situation with Donovan Mitchell, um, I felt that if you moved RJ and you moved uh, Obi and even uh, Quigley, you'd be re repeating what you did and getting rid of Gallinari and Andy Routens, I believe it was, and uh, some of the other guys that were on that team, to, to and Will, I think Wilson Chandler as well, to get mellow. And so I, I think the Knicks in this situation um, are in prime position um, to do well. Donovan would have definitely been a splash, but it's my understanding, again, um, that had Donovan been moved to the Knicks, um, that Mello was, was soon to follow him, and then you're looking at other options. So, yeah, that, in answer to your question, you, you asked me a question. I went on a tangent, but my, <laughs> it's my okay. understanding that if had Donovan been traded, yes, that's where he would be. Damn. You know, like as a Knicks fan, I was like, dude, they're, they're going to give up a lot for Mitchell. And, like, you kind of felt like Melo was waiting for that because that was, like, really the last big domino to fall in free agency. Um, yeah, and, and, I'll, and I'll add, you know, from my conversations, you know, his son, Melo maintains a house in, in Manhattan. And, you know, his son plays high school basketball as a student at Christ the King. Yep. Um, and, you know, Melo really wanted to be home and, and, and see his son play. Queens is next to, to, to Brooklyn. And, you know, Manhattan is not that far from Queens. So, um, you know, the holdout is there, but um, I'll be honest with you, if Milwaukee calls, you answer the phone. All right, so let me ask you this, Scoop. What's next? Is it just waiting for a call? Is it like a Portland situation a few years ago where it's like you wait for an injury? Like, what's is he just in, in holding position? It, it reminds me of like the quarterback position where, you know, like you saw Cam Newton end up coming back to um, the Panthers. Uh, a season or two ago. Um, and I think I, I just want to clear this up because sometimes, you know, on Twitter people are like, well, what's up? Like, why hasn't he signed? And I think oftentimes it's it's the waiting game, but it's also Melo's had his chance to pick certain teams. Like if I'm, I, I know that um, a couple years ago when he was out, you know, the Detroit's had some interest, but he's not going to sign to Detroit. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you you look at even a team like Memphis. Memphis, to me, you know, is, I think Danny Green, once healthy, is in a prime position there um, because he's won multiple championships. You kind of look at him like maybe he's not the coolest kid on the block, but he actually is because, you know, he he's going to fill an Andre Iguodala role for that Memphis Grizzlies team in the, in the long run. Um, but, you know, specifically to your question about Melo, you kind of need that – 
that same type of uh, Iguodala, but the cooler, cooler. Not to say Iguodala is not cool, but the the more cooler version of that to this generation. Um, and so I, I I think Brooklyn is still a fit, um, but I know that you know the teams that have had some interest uh, remain the Suns, um, and the Suns are kind of in an interesting situation because you know the Jay Crowder situation is kind of like the Julius Randle or Donovan Mitchell, what if situation, if, if yep. this goes here and then this por- this portion is cut, then here he can come here. So it's one of those situations. Chris Paul and, and, and Melo have been friends for years. They're both part of team Jordan. Uh, it, it's kind of just a domino. So like, like you, you alluded to when you asked, yeah, it's, it's injury. It's transactional as well. Um, it's one of those things where you, you can pick up your spare on, on the bowling alley, but you, you might still be able to, to, to fare well. Um, once you do pick him up. Yo, real quick, sorry to interrupt if you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, but just wanted to let you know that we have merch at Control the Narrative, and it's uh, pretty fire, in my opinion. This is the Pixel Mellow t-shirt that I'm rocking. Anything from Cuse Mellow to New York Mellow, Hoodie Mellow on this shirt. We got Scapegoat merch. We got Black Ball merch. We got just regular Control merch. Um, shop com t-shirts hoodies hats beanies stickers shop ctrl the narrative.com i think i got my point across go check it out i bet you you'll find something you like appreciate the support as well obviously you know the merch sales help us fund these podcast episodes that we get to record every single week so appreciate you um and back to the show okay second to last question can you share any of the teams that have had interest and may or may not have made formal offers to mellow this off this summer off season? Um, the teams that have had interest were the ones I mentioned, the Brooklyn Nets. It was no formal offer from what I know. Um, the Phoenix Suns, uh, don't know that there was a formal offer there. Uh, the Golden State Warriors, no formal offer there. Um, I do know that the Knicks, it was a semi-formal but formal offer there. Um, I don't know that the Lakers called after they signed Juan Toscano Anderson, um, but but I know that the, the, the team that had the the, te- the teams that had the most interest it was the Knicks on the on the front office side, the Nets on the player side. Interesting. Okay, scoop in your gut. Nets, Warriors, Suns, Knicks, and now we're gonna add Bucks into this. If you if we fast forward two months, what uniform is Melo wearing? I think that the situ- If you ask me today, I say the Bucks. Um. But I, Easy fit. I, I, but I, but I still don't count out the Nets. That's why it's not easy for me to give you one answer. If you ask me today, yeah. October seventeenth. Well, if you but based off what I know about the Nets, it's not the Nets. Despite having injuries, the best fit currently is the Bucks. Two months from now, if he's still sitting around, I say the Nets. Yeah, and he wants to stay home. We know that. In New York, like you just said, son's going to school in Queens. And that probably had a lot to do with this whole Knicks thing. Obviously, he played there for six and a half years. And also Brooklyn. Like, I know that Brooklyn has tried getting him in the past, like you just mentioned also. And he was always like, I don't know if I could do that to Knicks fans and, and you know, cross to the other side. But at this point, it's almost like desperation. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I know – I had a conversation with with an executive in the Eastern Conference some years ago when Melo was sitting out, um, and this person is still in a in a front office position. And they told me in a in a closed door meeting, one of the biggest regrets that I that I have made this that I've had this season is not signing Melo. And this is a, a prominent Eastern Conference team, um, and they felt like at the time. Melo was not playing adequate defense, um, and they felt like um, he wouldn't be a good fit. And then they saw him play in Portland, and their response and quote was, "Holy shit!" <laughs> oh, that's perfect. And they were like, "Damn, we should have signed him." And uh, yeah, that was like a couple weeks, maybe like a month after I was with Melo at that Lou Gehrig uh, yeah. function when he was like, "I'll be back two thousand percent." And um, but that but that particular executive was like, yo, we should have jumped on that. And and they didn't. Interesting. All right. Scoop. Last question before I get you out of here. 
a couple of minutes before is in general, what's one storyline you're most excited to see play out this season? This could be on a player basis, team basis, scenario basis. Just what are you really looking forward to this NBA season? The Timberwolves are busy. <laughs> I like the yeah. Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, I, I think, you know, over the last couple of years, they've been looking to um, – They've been looking to really just upgrade. You know, Carl Anthony Towns, I think, is in a very similar situation that Anthony Davis is in, as far as you know the 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 four position and people weren't thinking as though they need to they need to slide into the five position. And I think, you know, that the Timberwolves showed their commitment. If 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 Carl Towns says jump, they're gonna, Minnesota's going to say how high they love his one for draws out there. And you know, they brought in Rudy Gobert. Um, and I really think Anthony Edwards is going to have a phenomenal year. Uh, for that team, um, I, I just think over the over the last couple of years, you've just seen them build, 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 um, and so I like the Timberwolves a lot. Um, I like the Washington Wizards as well. Um, I, I really am interested in, and intrigued to see how well um, Bradley Beal, Kyle Kuzma, and Chris Depps Porzingis work, and they upgraded at the point guard position with Monty Morris, a uh, guy who grew up with Kuzma in Flint, um, and you know. I really like their bench, uh, the guys that they have there. And um, probably the last thing that I'm interested in uh, is the, the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, I, I really think they have the keys to uh, make some things happen, uh, specifically because everybody's healthy. Uh, Terrence Mann sat with me over at Ballet Sports in the summertime and said this is the first time since he's been there that, you know, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, are healthy, and then you bring in John Wall, who has something to prove. And I'll add uh, the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, I think that they are in prime position to do well uh, with everybody healthy. Um, I, I really like that team, Brandon. It is Brandon Ingram's team. I think the best thing that they did was bring in CJ McCollum and you know get th those two guys on the same page with Zion, and hopefully he's healthy. I think the Pelicans, with or without Zion, are going to be good. Um, but 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 that's that's what I have, and I and I'm interested to see. Lastly, I know I said this was the last one how the Knicks are going to do. Um, I want to see them do well. I think it does great for, for the city uh, to see both the Knicks and the Nets do, do well, just like you're seeing in football, the Jets and the Giants do well. There's room for everybody to shine. And uh, we, we saw that kind of during baseball season at points with the the, 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 the Yankees uh, and the Mets. And, you know, hopefully that, that can be the case in Manhattan and Brooklyn with the Nets and the Knicks. Yeah. At the very least, the Knicks, if they're competitive, that's a win. Five oh, best basketball. I, I think they're easily a 43 to 45 win team. We'll take it. 48, huge, I'll even give them. Huge step. Um, Scoop, it's been a while. I appreciate you more than you know for taking some time out and doing this. But before we let you go, one thing we do around here, as you know, is we allow our guests to control a narrative. It doesn't have to be basketball related. It doesn't have to be sports related. Um, so if you have one and you wanted to control a narrative, the floor is yours. Um, I want to control the narrative of Kanye West. Uh, I think that we as consumers, we as educated people and us as uh, the informed uh, fan, uh, as I'm talking to you, I'm looking at my computer, Forbes did an article and the headline is Kanye's future. And it says the fate of Kanye's career is in his fans' hands, PR professionals say. Uh, you have the right to turn on and turn off what you want to see and you want to hear. Uh, and you also have two eyes and one mouth. There's a reason why you have two eyes and one mouth. You speak once, think twice. And um, if you're reading in between the lines, I think you know what I'm saying. And that's just in media in general. Just uh, keep your eyes open. We spend a lot of time at home. Uh, don't just be uh, led by clickbait. Actually do the research. And that's outside of just Kanye, that's basketball. Um, that's politics. Everything. That's, life. that's that's my narrative, and uh, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well said, as always, Brandon Robinson. Dude, again, appreciate you more than you know. And uh, good luck with everything you're doing, man. Keep killing it. Obviously, it's going to be a busy, busy NBA season for you, and we're all looking forward to follow along, bro. Brother, thank you for the opportunity to be myself. Enjoy that baseball game. Yes, sir. Stay mellow, Scoop.